Outside of that, I try to stay inside as much as I can. It's it's been a little. Cool. I said that to Salky. I yeah. said, "Hey, I haven't seen Jerry walking around as much He's in years past." Now we know the answer. Yeah, New Jersey guy who said, "I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with the cold." I pop anymore. in, I pop out. <laughs> Actually, you know, Justin walked by my office. This was a couple of days ago, ah, about a week ago, and uh, and I said, "Where are you headed?" He was all bundled up, sweatshirts. He had the hat on, and I, and I said, "Where are you headed?" He goes out to watch live BP. I said, "Who's throwing?" He said, The Rock. I said, I trust he's good. I'll see him next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is some of that by design also? I mean, as you and Justin have sort of moved into your newer roles, I know that you know you still do this and, and a lot of the outward-facing stuff, but I, I would think some of that might be by design to get Justin as the general manager out there and, and sort of into that role more. You know, he's always been. He's always been fairly active, pretty present on the field with the players in the spring, you know, in and out, getting to know people. I mean, he's doing more in terms of, you know, outward facing media this spring than he ever has before, which I think is that's by design and I think a good thing. But by and large, our our interaction, the way we work together hasn't changed considerably. You know, he's he was always responsible for much more than people were aware of. Now it's just something that we've made a little more public. How much trust is there between you two? Uh, I think it's seamless. We're, we're, you know, as a rule, we've been together for most of the last decade. And, you know, he knows how I think. I generally know how he thinks. Uh, he is, uh, he's strong enough to tell me, I think you're a little crazy there, <laughs> to, I think you're out of your mind and usually use some, some colorful ways of expressing that. But uh, there's, I, I lean on him for just about everything we do. I, any idea that I have, I bounce on it off of him before I go anywhere else with it. And, and generally speaking, I think that's the, the, he feels the same way. It's a reciprocal type of relationship. You know, Jerry, many fans have gotten through HBO's Hard Knocks to see behind the scenes in football, right? Especially training camps through the years. I don't know if you've ever taken those in or watched any Hard Knocks, but cameras are all over the place. There are meetings rooms, there are personnel meetings and everything else. I think we got a pretty good sense for what Hard Knocks and what an NFL training camp's like. If there was a camera following you and Justin and all day long today, walk me through what, what a day and an evaluation and, and just spring training at this stage now looks like. Uh, it, it's certainly not hard knocks, you know, <laughs> the, although I've had my fair share through the years. Yeah, this is mostly, you know, the early stages of spring training. We're trying not to evaluate. You're, you're going to get excited by what you see with some guys, but the biggest mistakes that you'll make as an evaluator in our mm -hmm. game are typically made in February and in early March. You know, you're going to get too excited by, by something that, that grabs your attention in the early bullpens in the six pack. Uh, an oppo taco on an 0-2 count yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> There's, there are reasons to be excited. You know? <laughs> and, I, you know, I will say that you try to temper your, your, your excitement while building the, the optimism when you see, especially with the young players. I, mm -hmm. I've said this before, with old players, never, when you, when you look at a player who's been around for 10, 12 years, they're in spring training, and, and they're, they're preparing, don't, don't look at them through the lens of, man, he doesn't look good. You know, with the young player, oftentimes you're seeing the best that they have to offer. And when the games start, the competition on the field is a, is a fine time to start assessing where the young players are. Because they come to work every day and they're there to show you the best of what they have. Mm -hmm. The veteran player is more in, in line with, you know, preparing himself for the season. They, they, they feel a degree of comfort in, in where their position lies on the roster and there's less urgency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we get deeper into the spring now, we might that those those two roads may intersect. And somewhere about the middle of March, you're going to start assessing players, you know, on the same plane rather than trying to separate them by experience. So where is Jared Kelnick at right now? Uh, could not be any more optimistic about the changes that he's made. And, and some of this is, is not just the results that he's achieving in the game. It's not just how good he's looked on the fields in, in practice from the moment we got here. It's what we know of his offseason and, and the things that he's done to, to focus on what we're seeing, which is you know some level of swing change, some level of approach change, some level of, of just adapting to you know major league pitching. It's just taking him a little while longer than it takes others. Is his swing shortened? You hear that so often, I think, with players through the years, and especially with the stuff they're facing now and 
Salk and I got to see the trajectory arc. Like, <laughs> this stuff coming at you is just different. It's coming in pretty good. Is, is it, I mean, is it oversimplification to say, yeah, you know, he's just continued to kind of shorten that swing? He's always had a pretty short or direct swing. You know, mm-hmm. Jared's swing, if you were to look at it from the moment we, we acquired him, it's a pretty flat swing, you know, and, and uh, which is not uncommon with good hitters who use the field to hit. And, you know, through the years, you, you would define flat swings as if you looked at batting chance are the guys that are at the top of the, the, the batting average leaders. Very common. He's got a little more tilt in his swing, and it's shorter on the front end. You know, on the front end, he is, there's, there's a little more you know, uptick, you know, mm-hmm. as he as he comes through the zone and then he's and he's shorter on the extension on the backside, which I think gives him more barrel control through the strike zone. And uh, it's certainly I will say this. I don't, I don't think he's hit a ball under 100 miles an hour since the since the spring began. And and, you know, he's he's roasting the, the league mm-hmm. in that it's 105 to 113 mile an hour exit velocity almost every time he swings the bat, which is it pretty good it's pretty good we're always impressed with his maturity i mean we talk a lot about how young he is and and for good reason baseball maturity i think he's still probably growing into it but i think he gets really an unfair reputation I think people think he's a meathead because they kind of see him and they heard the smell you later and some of the brashness that he had when he first came up and then every time we sit down with him and people hear him and actually listen to him throughout an interview we just get a completely different reaction because he's thoughtful, because he's smart, because he seems to starting. It seems like he's starting to have an understanding of who he is. Oh, I think that's true. But I think the you know the idea the idea that he was ever a meathead is probably a, an assumption. Yeah. There's a, he's actually very smart. He's very prepared. He's an intense player on the field and and in the way he works, you know, off of the field. And, you know, the, the fact that he was brash, particularly when he first arrived here, it's that's, you know, that's where you can read a little of that into. I think he's grown there, too. You know, if, if you follow him around this spring, it's a there is a there's a definite maturation that has happened over the course. And I even go back to midsummer last year from midsummer last year to where we sit today. He has matured so much and. And you were never going to find anyone who was more intent with their work habits, who came to the ballpark with a plan, who had goals to what he wanted to achieve. You know, now he's combined that with, you know, he's 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 grown up quite a bit. And and I think he's learned better how to deal with the, the, the ups and downs. You know, I, the baseball is, you know, it's a long season. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you get too down with the downs, it, it's very hard to recover. And that's, I think he's doing a great job with that. How's Perry Hill's infield, man? Have you watched any of Perry Hill over there? He's okay. Uh, okay. He's a myth, you know. <laughs> he's a, he's a mythical character, Perry Hill. He's, he's a machine, he's excellent. man. He is so fun because he's right next to us with anybody from someone that wanted to learn how to some of the fundamentals so he could coach a softball team to Colton Wong over here with that discipline. And you know, we were just talking about it earlier. Is, is this common, Jerry? You would know better than I. But to see the coaches around here, Edgar's coaching here, Dan Wilson's coaching here, Alvin Davis is coaching here, Ichiro is coaching here. Is that common in baseball, that to have former players, Cameron's here, is engaged coaching as we see here? Ichiro's here. I said Ichiro. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, Ichiro's Ichiro. always here. Always. <laughs> He's here all day. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so, from more, it's more common for some organizations than it is for others. You know, we, it, for us, it's very common to have those, you know, those types of presence around. You know, I think here this month, I anticipate we'll see Ken Griffey Jr. a little bit as he starts to integrate for the WBC. Um, it, we've had great players who, who have stuck around the organization. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that's it's, what it is. It's a great resource for our players more so than any nugget that they might give them as to how to pick up a ground ball or how to hit a fastball it's a resource resource for them for what we were talking about a moment ago with jk it's how you manage your way through the season it's the the psychology of being a long season baseball player and mm-hmm. and these guys have done it as well as any players have ever done it and to to use those resources is wise and and we've done i think organizationally a great job of keeping those players around our system for that it was cool hearing Julio talk a little bit, uh, what was it, two days ago that we talked to Julio about at least one of the guys up on that on that uh, mural in Ichiro because something's happening to, to Julio. He's becoming a superstar, and most of that is great, 
And some of it is going to come with some trade-offs, right? And some challenges that are ahead of them. And not too many people understand what it's really like. I know you were around a couple superstars in your day as a player, and you've had a couple here in Seattle. But it was cool to hear uh, Julio say that he's talked to Ichiro a little bit about that. And, and I would think it'd be something on your mind and Scott's mind almost all the time. How do you help this kid achieve everything you need him to achieve and be a face of baseball without it becoming a problem for him and a challenge for him to deal with? You know, so much of it is going to be because of the way Julio was raised and wired. You know, if you meet Julio's parents, there's a, he, there, they have, they have set a bar, you know, for, for the way you, you go about doing things, the way you go about your business. And it's very clear in how Julio treats people and how he interacts with his teammates. You know, that's step one. And, and that takes care of a good deal of it. I'm always reminded, you know, when I think of two really unique situations, when I talk about where I think about, you know, players evolving into stars or what it's like to be in that type of fishbowl and you know I always think of the, the great Marilyn Monroe Joe DiMaggio interaction where you know Marilyn Monroe says D you can't imagine what it's like to have millions of people adore you every day and the pressure that that creates and and Joe DiMaggio said I have a pretty good idea <laughs> and you know it, it, they just did it in different worlds and and years ago when I was with the Angels when Mike Trout had just finished his rookie of the year and now he's you know finished second in the MVP and He's come out for his second spring training. I can remember Albert Pujols being interviewed. Uh, it was a live interview on tape and and uh, or on film, and and he was asked the question: Can you imagine a, a player this young being this good? And how you how do you manage that? And he said. Yeah, I, I can imagine it. <laughs> and having players that have been through that, and th this is our great fortune with guys like Junior and Ichiro especially, who experience this at, at really the, 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 the top level that you can experience it, where they're international superstars. Uh, Julio is trending in that direction. He's, he's very popular among Major League fans right now. He's super popular in our fan base. You know, and he has, he has something different than just the skills on the field that, that he brings to the table. Uh, helping him manage that is is going to be best seen through people who've been through it before because the rest of us are just trying to keep him you know i, I guess rooted the others can teach him how to handle the you know the, the the asteroids that come flying in from outer space well i'll tell you what's different his eyes he, he has got like I, beautiful i mean they're just he does say, they're, beautiful eyes. they are beautiful eyes and then he sat where you're sitting and he doesn't take his eyes like when you talk to him I was exhausted. I, I was done after the interview because I can't look away. Like, he's not looking away, so I can't look away. Does he engage you in that same just... You know, oh, yeah, but it's not... It's, it, it's so endearing. You know, yes. he, he has... His, I'll give you a quick, you know, anecdote. And my, my daughter, my younger daughter, spent seven years in Hong Kong, and she came back from Hong Kong after not being in the United States for seven years, and she happened to come back in July of 2022. And... I'm standing in my living room watching the, the, the home run derby, and she comes over and stands next to me as the, the, the crowd is roaring and Julio's smiling and is hitting another homer. And they did a, a close-up with what I thought were awesome you know, camera angles at the home run derby last year. And they got on top of Julio, and she said, oh, my God, look at his eyes. <laughs> She said he is going to be a star. And she didn't know anything about him yes. hitting homers, had never yes. heard of him before that day. It was, he has a different, you know, a, a different magnetism that, yep. that doesn't, you know, exist with every player that you run across. And he wants to. Brock and I have really been struck by how many good dudes are on this team. And, and it, I, I want to ask you how you achieve that, but also it finally feels like this is 100% your team and Scott's team. And, it, you know, it's been eight years and I think we could say that over time it grew in percentage wise year. And I was thinking about it. This finally feels like it was entirely built by you and Scott exactly the way you guys want this. I think, I think and that's true. As well. Yeah. And, and Justin's been a part of it really from, you know, just about from day one. But you know, and I could qualify Andy McKay. He's a, you know, the players that have grown through our system. Few people have had a bigger impact on their careers than, than Andy or some of the, the coaches that have been here for so many years. But that's the, you know, it takes time. And I know Scott was quoted in a, in a recent story in, in just that way. 
we have had the benefit of an ownership group that allowed us to do this, mm -hmm. uh, allowed us to take the time to do it right and, and not to have to go back and plug holes because you tried to shortcut it and, you know, and have a long range plan. And, and this was, if you think about it, when we, when we went through our rebuild after the 2018 season, the commitment that that required from ownership to say, I understand that, that it might get a little bumpy. We trust you. And, and I do think that this was what we envisioned was a team. It's, it's not just 26. We had 76 guys in camp and they're great you guys. 59 last yeah. year, right? right? 59 guys played in the majors last year for you. God, I just, I look at, at what you've got, and it sure seems like you may use another 55 plus this year again. You And in and, and today's game, you will due to injuries, due to the, the, you know, the, the bumps and the bruises that you experience, you know, guys wind up on the IL and, and that's the way it works. But, you know, you want to have depth. I've never been more confident in the depth that we've had organizationally than the group you see today. So give me a couple guys who you're not counting on. You don't need them to have career years, as we said. Or even be their baseball right, card. Or even hit their baseball card like Arizona's starting to start to warm up a little bit here. Give me a few guys who, if they had a great season, would just be icing on the cake and really awesome for your team. You know, maybe the most encouraged uh, I am about any player who who and what he's come into camp in the non Jared Kelnick category, because I think that is the first answer to the question is, you know, if JK is able to break out and do the things that we think or believe he's capable of, it just changes our entire the view of our team, you know. And that's both internal and external. And part of what we're betting on, you know, we've, we've bet on, on him. And I, and I think he is going to deliver on that. And we're, we're seeing the early stages. Uh, the other guy who's really shown up and can change the way we see ourselves is Robbie Ray. You know, it's a uh, Robbie's a, a, a year removed from a Cy Young award. His first two outings in the spring have been awesome. And, and, and it's very, very 2021 Robbie Ray. I think we're seeing a different version of him there. Mm -hmm. You know, I could put Marco in that bucket. You know, Marco is, you know, very quietly of, since 2018. Marco's third in the American League in innings, third in the American League in wins. You know, he's, if, if this were 1977, we would be celebrating the things that, that Marco delivers every day. And, you know, and instead we, we, we've dealt with a lot of scrutiny about what the things he doesn't do. But he does do a lot of really positive things and delivers a lot of quality starts. And that type of depth makes us a different team. You know, and I think it's just finding that one bat that clicks for us. You know, who that bat is, I'm not entirely sure yet in our system. Uh, as we cycle through the, the DH position, you want one guy to be able to step up and take a bulk of those. That could be Evan White, you know, and it's a guy we're not really counting on coming into spring training, who I think has looked outstanding in the early going. Again, trying to temper the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. but he changes our team defensively if, if he hits. And, and he doesn't have to hit fourth or fifth. He can hit seventh or eighth. And, and if he hits, it just changes the way our team is perceived and the way our team functions. How about just from a data standpoint is now yeah, a week and a half in, starting to play some games that you start to collect some of your numbers. Are there some younger guys that, you know, some of those minor leaguers that you're starting to look at some, whoa, the spin rate or this VLO or this exit VLO in the cage? Are there a few that are kind of popping? There are more than a few. Uh, you know, the, the one who pops immediately or two that pop immediately, we've talked extensively about one is Bryce Miller. Uh, his first outing was everything that you could have... Yep. Uh, uh, envisioned and and really did pop the, the 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 data you know attached to his fastball especially has been you know, it's it's otherworldly we think it's the most impactful fastball in the minor leagues for a pitcher who starts you know it's a, it's a different quality if you're if you're talking about short relievers mm -hmm. and then the other guy who really jumped off the page in terms of pitch quality was Perlander Baroa and you know it, it was three pitches that really blew up the the data systems and and uh, very impressive in how he managed the strike zone you know that's something that that if he figures that out he's 22 years old if Perlander figures out command with the physical stuff he has changes the world for us i think i see luis with him an awful lot yeah. you know in his bullpens and in conversations i think luis looks at him and goes "Ooh, this kid's got some kind of special stuff too eating lunch you know they'll, they'll it's, and this is you know that the, this is a very close-knit team and i know you guys have been around it a little bit and you know i've never been around a baseball team and i said that part of my opening you know the to, with the group and i and i try not to be you know as verbose as i am in situations like these i'll, I'll be shorter and to the point 
you know, he, uh, this group is about as close as any I've encountered. They enjoy playing together more than any other group I've ever had. And, uh, you know, part of that is because the young guys feel comfortable with the veteran players. The veterans are giving to the young guys. They all, you know, they connect with the community. It's a, it's really, uh, I, I pinch myself every day when I get to the ballpark that we have, you know, I, some of it is luck. Some of it is, is by design. Some of it is, uh, is, uh, the, a good selection process in, yeah. in the human being rather than just the talent. And and when you're around Luis Castillo, you're gonna, not going to be around a better guy. He's an inviting personality. He's he, He's got a smile for everyone. He's going to give you the time of day. And, you know, when if I'm Prelander Baroa and I look at our staff and I think, who do I want to be like? You know, I, I might pick the rock too. <laughs> yep. I really, really like him. I really like Luis Castillo. He it's, is, it's a bit much. Yeah, they've been playing the ghost music from the, from the Potter's Wheel and all no, that for no. me. But he's a real ace. And, and it is funny. He does have a lot of kind of early Felix to him. I mean, the repertoire to me, I always think Pedro. But when I see him and the way he kind of just casually moves around here and the smile, he's not aloof at all. Felix at the end kind of maybe got a little aloof. But he's got some of that like, just confidence that comes with being an ace. He, he really does. And, cool. and I think, you know, that in, in itself is what makes an ace an ace. You know, and and, uh, and he, he has a way that he carries himself. It, it, he's very confident, uh, also very smart. You know, it, it, when you sit down and you talk to, to Luis, he's, he's laid back. He's relaxed. He's very uh, aware of what's happening around him. And, and I think he is aware in a way that maybe he wasn't when he was younger as to how he can affect, positively affect every outcome, the day, that day's game, even when he's not pitching by things he does with the younger guys like a Prelander Baroa. We've just had so much fun down here, Jerry. Honestly, I mean, talking to Logan Gilbert about his weird bag of toys and talking to Paul Seawald about his understanding of the game and where he was at to where he is now. Talking to Tay Oscar this morning, who just, uh, he's kind of an interesting one. I, we were talking about him with Shannon a few minutes ago. He seemed at first to maybe be a little bummed out, right? I mean, he, he had grown close to those guys in Toronto. Loves the idea of being wanted, but also it's a little bit of a disruption. He's here on a one-year deal. You know, I, I'm kind of curious to see how he gets almost assimilated into the Mariner culture this year. You know, he seems to have fit in right away. It's at first, you know, and you hit on it. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes and sitting down with Teo to think, boy, I really like this guy. He's a, he's easy to spend time with. He's he's very, you know, he's authentic. confident, but soft spoken. You know, he is he's very authentic. Uh, I, when you play anywhere for as long as he played in Toronto, you're going to you create relationships. You 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 really feel like you're part of, of the fabric and it's hard to move on. You know, I, I was traded twice in my career. He's now been traded twice. It's a that's that's a tough thing. And, uh, you know, you move on, you'll adapt. Players adapt. And, you know, like part of why we set up the the, the systems, the, the, the programs, the way we have part of why that we are proud of the way our clubhouse community has evolved is it is it allows the next player to come in and feel like he's part of it and I, and I think very quickly you look around the room and, and you see AJ Pollock how quickly he assimilated you see Teo and how quickly he became part of it you see Colton you know and how quickly he is wow this is it's a little bit different and I like the way it's different uh, and I'm, I'm i'm proud of that environment well thank you we appreciate it thanks for bringing in a bunch of guys for us to interview yep. it's a lot more fun than it was maybe 10 years ago <laughs> when we were searching going i don't know who we're going to talk to we're going to need to find somebody over here who will actually come sit down with us it's radio host dream man we're having a blast this week thanks jerry we appreciate it all right guys thanks, there you jerry. go our weekly chat with jerry depoto we'll be right back it's brock and salk Seattle sports on 710